Great. So Alejandro, do you want to start, kick it off? Sure. Um, yeah. Welcome everyone. Um, let's see. Uh, sorry. Jump a slide. Um, yeah. So today we're going to be talking about um, some generative AI uh, apps that people have probably seen in production from different companies like Instacart and Shopify. Um, little background on the speakers. Um, I'm Alejandro Cantrero. I'm field CTO for AI uh, here at Datastax. Um, I built production AI and ML apps at a lot of companies, including uh, Tribune Publishing, Los Angeles Times, as well as some generative AI work at uh, Shopify, and then also for a number of early stage companies kind of in social media, mobile apps, and, and blockchain. Hi, my name's Alan Ho. I'm VP of product for AI at Datastax. Uh, engineer, entrepreneur, physicist by training. I built AI products at Google Research, Apogee, and uh, semiconductor industry called PDF Solutions. And uh, today I'm going to be, uh, I'm so glad to be able to talk to my friend Alejandro. And we're just going to talk a little bit about how to build actual production Gen AI apps. Um, so maybe, you know, uh, Alejandro, why don't you just kick it off? Um, show us a little bit about some generative a gen generative AI apps that are out there in production that people are using today. All right, let's take a look. And also, just so people know, yeah, there are some slides, but we will get to some actual code and kind of show how to do this um, in practice uh, before we get to the end. All right, um, so for Gen, I Gen AI apps in production, let's see. Ugh. I guess the video isn't playing on this one, unfortunately. Um, Instacart uh, has a ChatGPT plugin. Maybe folks have seen it. Basically, you can chat with um, ChatGPT, say, hey, you know, uh, I want to cook um, some Italian food tonight. It'll make you some suggestions like, oh, there's a lot of different types of Italian food. Here's some things you could do. And then um, at the end, you can say, hey, make me a, a shopping list. And then the Instacart plugin kicks in, creates a shopping list, sends you out to Instacart. Um, you can get your food delivered. So um, kind of a simple example. Um, in the e-commerce space about actually kind of like building stuff into the company's cart, which is kind of all they really care about, right? It's like they, they got to get people to add products into their cart and, 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 and then check out. So kind of their whole um, gen, generative AI flow is kind of designed around that. Um, another one in the e-commerce space is Shopify. Um, maybe folks have seen this. Shopify has uh, an app called the Shop App. Um, this is like an aggregation of um, many of their different merchants and you can kind of browse it um, like you would uh, an Amazon or a more central location for a lot of different products from a lot of different vendors as opposed to going directly to say a particular merchants uh, site and they've added a chat bot here and it, it does a few things right you can talk to it you can tell it hey you know I, I, I want to buy a hat oh I you know um, it shows you some options. You say, oh, that's not what I'm looking for. I want a hiking hat. And then it'll kind of get more specific. You could then ask a follow-up question like uh, make it a different color or, um, you know, I don't know, make sure it can float in water. And, you know, it's going to bring back options. You can see at every step, it kind of shows you some products. At every step, it gives you some recommendations about like what exa other examples you could click into um, to, to help you navigate the search path. And also, again, targets right from this interface, you can actually purchase, you know, any of these products. Hey, before you go there, um, and by the way, everyone, uh, I'm going to, I'm also reading your questions. So if you have questions, feel free to type them in. Uh, but I got a question for you because, um, uh, you have a lot of experience with Shopify. Like has this actually helped them with their conversion rates or what was some of the early feedback on this, uh, generative AI app for them? Yeah, I think, you know, products like this are, are really good because I think for anybody that's kind of worked in recommender systems before, um, you know, one of the problems is that you often encounter is, you know, um, surfacing up products that are, are maybe more unusual or things you wouldn't have thought about or you didn't necessarily think about in um, the search query that you typed in, right? If I, if I type in, um, uh, you know, skewers for cooking, Japanese um, food, you know, it's going to give me a set of skewers, but it's not going to show me kind of other things that might be related to, you know, cooking a, a meal of Japanese food for some friends I'm going to invite over. Uh, if you type into, you know, the chat bot, hey, I want to host a 
dinner party where I'm going to serve Japanese food, it's going to present you with a bunch of different options that could be like table settings, stuff to do the cooking, uh, sauce packets you can buy, right? So this helps you kind of discover things that you weren't even aware existed, which is very hard to do with a more traditional kind of e-commerce search. Cool. All right. Unfortunately, it looks like the ones that are actual videos um, and not um, animated GIFs are, are, are not playing, so we can't kind of demo the experience. But um, Booking.com has an AI chatbot. Um, if you open up, the, it's in their mobile app. Uh, you can go in, you can click this tryout button. Um, primarily what this does is it recommends lodging. So you say, hey, I, I'm going to Macau. Where should I stay? Um, then they they know they need some more information so it, it you know they're trained it to ask follow-up questions okay what dates are you traveling how many people are in your party you know once it's kind of collected all the information it needs it then shows you actual kind of lodging options and you can directly book them um, you can also talk to the chat bot and say hey um, what should i do while i'm in macau and it's going to recommend a bunch of activities that you can do however you can't book any activities um, and you can't uh handle, you know, on their website, they do have, you can see up top, they've got flights and car rentals and things like that. However, the chatbot's not able to kind of execute on, on those options, you know, primarily because, you know, if you've used booking.com, it's a, it's a lodging platform. I think they have to like link out to these other sites to kind of cover these other use cases. And so the chatbot itself isn't able to directly action on it. And I think this is kind of interesting because, you know, when people thought about generative AI apps, you know, it was kind of intuitive that you can do recommendations. Um, you can do some summarization of, app, of of text, but it wasn't very clear that it, you know when Gen AI first started that it would be able to do planning at all. Like you know, come up with a list of things I should be doing over time. And I think that's kind of a very uh, surprising application of Gen AI uh, over the last couple of years. Yeah, definitely. All right, and then we've got one last example here. Um, I think this one is probably the one people are most familiar with is the customer support use case. It's one where generative AI is being deployed a lot. I also put up there is slash virtual research assistant. You know, um, the same kind of design patterns here that work for customer service also work for, um, I'm a lawyer and I need to do some research on case law or uh, I'm a medical professional and I need to get some, you know, some information from kind of the latest research papers on a particular disease or, or treatment uh, solution. Um, you know, in these cases, you, you know, basically you've got a set of documents and you want to answer questions about those documents and you need to kind of pull in all your documents, load them up into a spot where you can search over them and then answer questions based on kind of what you found. And we'll kind of talk about this pattern um, more in a little bit. And, and maybe a question for you is that, like, in addition to just searching documents, what about kind of what, what would be some use cases where people would want to look up more real time information uh, in these kinds of scenarios? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, this same pattern um, also really applies into, into real time use cases. You could think of if you look, think about the research assistant angle, um, if you're using a research tool to help you uh, make investment decisions whether to buy or sell stock, um, you know, a lot of that depends on, on a very real time information, right? If, uh, if there was just a mass layoff, like announced an hour ago, or the CEO quit, or the company just acquired, <laughs> announced a merger or an acquisition, you know, all, all of these factors really drive like stock price. So if you're making a decision to buy or sell and your data's 24 hours out of date or a week out of date, um, you might make a very bad decision, right? Because you're, you're missing really critical information. Yeah. All right, well, why don't you tell me this, uh, what are some the challenges about building the, some of the shortcomings possibly. Yeah, so um, just really quickly, um, going back to the Instacart example, um, would you really want to cook food that ChatGPT recommended to you? Um, and here's some examples, you know, from the media. Um, the first one is probably the most honest one from uh, Good Morning America, where what they're really saying is like, you, you have to be a pretty decent chef to use ChatGPT for recipes because it's good at giving you inspiration, but because it will create new recipes, like it might have the proportions wrong. It might, you know, have balanced the flavors wrong in the flavor profile of the food. So you kind of have to know what you're doing. If you're an amateur cook or someone like me who can cook well, but needs a, a clear recipe to follow, um, it's probably not a good idea. Um, the latter two are a little bit more in the realm of, um, you know, 
um, taking advantage of the bot. Like it'll recommend a recipe that creates chlorine gas. It's not going to do that just like on its own. They kind of prompted it to like use certain ingredients and prepare a meal. And then the meal prepared has this like bad consequence. Um, but you know, it, it's, you know, chat GBT is creating the recipes. It's not leveraging existing recipes. And so there's some real risk there. Um, you know, going back to the booking.com example, um, and again, I guess this was a real video, but if you, if you ask it about tours, um, it'll say, here's a bunch of things you can do. Here's activities you can do in the town you're going to visit. And it's going to tell you, and you can say, Hey, uh, book me a tour to go see that ancient ruin site. It's gonna say, Oh, I don't know. I can't book tours. Um, why can they not book tours? Because they don't have tours and activities in their platform. They're not like a trip advisor that has that as kind of first party data or a get your guide or these other websites that kind of focus on the, the tour part of traveling. Um, you know, they were clever and kind of worked around it by telling you we can't do that. And then they do have enough information to make recommendations of, oh, you could go contact these tour providers. Like they have scraped that information. And so the bot will tell you who you can go contact, but they can't kind of fully automate the process that you're trying to do with their um, AI bot. So, so do you think um, uh, these kinds of apps will be able to start taking action in the world in the future? Like what, what do you think are some of the linchpins for that? Yeah, and you know, um, maybe I'll just jump one slide here for that. But I think it's to me you know, this really boils down to your LLM application needs data, right? If Booking.com has kind of like first-party data about trips and tours, then all of a sudden it can recommend very specific things, and it can take action, right? If they if their platform has the capability to book a tour, then they can kind of automate that process. And so I think a lot of companies are now going to be looking to as they, they build these assistants, they build these LLM tools and they find, you know, you're gonna wanna look at what questions are my customers asking the bot? What activities are they trying to do with it? And you're gonna wanna track this. And then you find, hey, you know, they really wanna book trips and tours. That's like 75% of the inquiries coming into my, you know, LLM assistant. And I can't do that. You know, you're gonna need to figure out how to kind of expand into that area so you can kind of increase utility for your, your customer base. So I think there's a really good chance to really learn about, you know, there's a real real time kind of product feedback mechanism here for your companies in in seeing like what do people actually want from us as a company or a brand like what are they asking us for in, in these experiences great uh and by the way everyone it, please feel free to ask questions in the q a i'm uh taking i'm constantly monitoring it for questions uh, as alejandro goes in uh through this presentation all right, so you know we gave some examples. So if you look back at all those examples we just ran through, like what kind of data do these experiences need? Well, for the Instacart example, you need recipes. For the Shop app, you need products. Um, Booking.com uses lodging and trips and tours, and then kind of these research assistants and customer support cases need documents with information. So um, we'll look at some kind of common design patterns here and then kind of how those can be put into practice um, to make these things more accurate. So just at a high level, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to dive deep into embeddings themselves because I think we want to get to like more advanced concepts of how you kind of put these all together. But um, as I think many people hopefully have seen at this point, you know, the way you store data to make work with these systems is with embeddings. Um, and embeddings are vector representations of objects that preserve semantic meaning, which is why they work with language models, right? So we get a mathematical representation that tells us that, um, hey, you know, all shoes are kind of related to each other, all footwear is kind of related to each other, um, recipes about Mexican food are all related, and so are, you know, recipes about Italian food. Um, these things get grouped together in the underlying vector space so you can kind of find similar uh, matches. So when you work with text data in particular, um, you know, basically the process is you take whatever your text data sources are, you need to chunk them into kind of smaller segments. Um, chunking is, you know, kind of very important both from just being able to fit the data into the restrictions of the language models that generate the embeddings, but also in making your embeddings useful. Um, if you embed a 20 page PDF file as a single embedding and then try to ask questions of it, you're gonna have a very hard time getting back like actual facts because facts in that document are probably limited to like a couple sentences or a paragraph. Um, so, you know, you have to kind of look at what are, what are my document sources look like? What information am I trying to extract from them and kind of use that to decide what is my chunking strategy gonna be? And then 
The next piece that I think is really important to think about is adding metadata to these vector embeddings, right? So when you store vector data, you're gonna wanna have metadata for really for two purposes. One purpose is to filter your, your searches. If you have a really big vector space and you're using approximate nearest neighbor search to retrieve data, you can start to see degradation in quality of the matches. You're not finding the true nearest neighbors to your actual search. So having some metadata to filter down the search space can help speed up search results because you're looking at less data, increase search result quality, um, also help you handle multiple use cases in one app if you've got a really varied data set and you wanna like pre-filter down to like different areas when different types of questions are being asked. And then the second part is what is your application actually doing? Right. I mean, there's going to be a lot of data you probably need after you actually retrieve the documents that you want to use, and then uh, you need to put that back into your application. So a simple example is you definitely need the text um, because you're going to have to put that back into the LLM, but a lot of times you might need other information as well. Um, maybe maybe you have information like page views on something or, or click-through rate on, on items that you're showing um, for... Um, like the products use case with Shopify, you know, you have price point available quantity, you know, should I even show something Maybe we're out of stock and I don't want to show it to people, right? So those are kind of pieces of information you're going to use downstream in your application. And then the last part of this is you need to store the data somewhere in some kind of vector index or vector data store. So actually, before you go there, um, that means that when you're storing, um, when you're storing, um, the information you also have to store all the information like click throughs and all that ideally in the same database can you surface that all to the user all at one time right? or change the ranking of your results is that right yes um i also want to address i saw one question come through on the booking.com um yeah in their app un unfortunately the video didn't load but you can see they recommend exact lodging places and you are able to then click and book the lodging directly through the chatbot experience um, so it kind of fully handles that one use case. All right, so you know, then let's look at how you kind of use these embeddings, how you kind of improve search results and, and the kind of things that um, I was asking about. Um, just really quickly, this is kind of like the first basic pattern. So a lot of apps like that shop app experience, like the recipe, uh, like the um, booking.com experience, really they're just doing vector search they don't really need to do much else right like you type in i want hats they do a vector search for hats they show you products and this is kind of this shows roughly how that works right you, when you do the embeddings you create a vector space things are in different locations when you make a query you take the term hats you run it back through the same embedding model and then you check for nearest neighbors and you find you know products that are hats. In this example, you know, you find Shakespeare plays because they're next to each other in different books by different authors or in a different part of the embedding space. Um, the, you know, getting to kind of a next level of complexity here is, you know, sometimes vector search is not enough. Uh, retrieval augmented generation, very common pattern. So here we're retrieving information, but then we're putting it back into the LLM for the LLM to reason about it, use it, and use that to generate an actual response, not just doing the um, vector search component. So the way that this kind of way you think about this is, you know, you've generated embeddings, they're stored in this database at the bottom. Um, you know, then you're gonna have a user issues an inquiry. So if you take our kind of Q and A example from earlier. Maybe you ask, how do I cancel my account, right? So that comes in, that gets sent also to the embedding API. You embed this query, how do I cancel my account? And then you search all of your vector embeddings with vector search that we kind of showed before to get back matching documents that you stored in your vector database. And then you take those documents and you feed them back to the LLM and you say, hey, LLM, user asked this question, how do I cancel my account? here's some documents I found that might answer that question. And you put the text of those documents in, like here's three documents I found that I think answer this question. Then you ask the LLM, consider these documents, see if you can answer the question. If these documents do not answer the question, you know, say, hey, I don't know what the answer is. I couldn't find it. You know, do you want to talk to a person? Um, yeah, we have a question on uh, from the, the chat is like, what, what is exactly an embedding? Sure. So we'll go back to kind of this this picture here. Um, so an embedding is a machine learning model. You put in, let's take the case of like text. 
you put in text, you get out a vector. Uh, so the vector is just a mathematical representation of that text or the product or the booking listing from booking.com. The most important thing about embeddings is that they preserve semantic similarity, which means that related concepts will be next to each other. They'll be nearby to each other in the vector space. So if you see this example that's running on the screen, it's embedding um, books, say, right? So, and it's grouping them kind of based on author in this case, or kind of topic area, right? So Pride and Prejudice, it's kind of one different piece of literature, Great Expectations, different author, two Shakespeare plays. And then when you, when you do a query, when you search a vector space, you search a vector space to say, hey, I want to find Shakespeare plays. You expect that kind of all the Shakespeare plays will be nearby to each other. They'll be in a cluster so that you can retrieve them and then um, kind of know like, you found what you're looking for. So hopefully that helps. Thanks. All right, so, so Alan touched on this a bit, but um, you know, let's go one step further. So now I've got vector search that returns me similar items when I do a search. So again, back to that Shopify example, I typed in, I want hats. So I embedded that query hats. I searched my database of products. It found a bunch of hats. And then I'm gonna return them to the user and show them, hey, here's the hats that I found. Well, you can do that. But you know, maybe we can think about, well, how could we improve the quality of the hats that we're showing to the customer? Because ultimately, we want them to buy something. Well, instead of, say, maybe just returning the three closest matches on vector similarity for hats, let's pull back 100 of the best matches for hats, and then let's re-rank those results based on some factor, some information that we have. So um, for a lot of use cases, you might have some proprietary data, right? So in the Shopify example, uh, we have order volume. Right, um, Shopify knows how much how much of each type of hat they're selling, which is a good gauge for kind of popularity of that particular product. So you could re-rank and show your best-selling top five hats, right? Which is likely to get you much better results in actually getting people to convert. If you're Booking.com and you're showing properties, um, you might want to re-rank on the reviews, right? Like some combination of review score and kind of total count of reviews. So they have at least five reviews and the total review score is above a 4.0 and then like let's sort by top review scores. So we'll show you kind of best properties first. Um, you know, maybe they took in information earlier on with the chatbot about your, your price sensitivity and they will re-rank by pricing, right? You can say, hey, I want to see this by price, like most affordable to, to um, least affordable, right? So these types of re-ranking will help you get better results because you're using information that kind of actually drives the end um, action you want your customers to take, right? You want them to book, you want them to purchase. Um, there are cases where you may not have good kind of proprietary data to put into the mix. And there are some techniques for that as well. And so there's one called maximal marginal relevance. Um, this one will work kind of purely for text problems. This will work purely on text data by basically kind of trying to, if you return a bunch of results, it'll start to remove redundant information, right? So if you're trying to do Q and A and you say, back to that example we gave earlier, hey, I wanna cancel my account and you return three documents and they kind of all say exactly the same thing, then you're not surfacing a lot of information to the LLM to kind of figure out what it should do, right? You know, maybe you have some different documents, one that says how to cancel your account. Maybe there's a special case of canceling your account when you have an unpaid bill Right. And so that's going to be in a different document. So you want to reduce that redundant information. So more context comes into the model. Um, MMR can also increase diversity in the set of information that's returned. So that's kind of the same idea that I said, if you're looking for cancellation information, increasing diversity is like, well, what happens in these edge cases? What happens if I have an unpaid bill? Uh, what happens if I've got, um, something configured in their product where like you have to go maybe delete something that you created before you're allowed to cancel the account. You have to like shut down the service and then you can kind of cancel your account, right? So increasing that diversity can get you better results. And uh, actually uh, just following up on that, like it's kind of intuitive why you might want to use maximal marginal relevance to reduce redundant information being sent back to the end user. But why does it matter for the LLM? Can the LLM just uh, filter those stuff out? Or uh, what, what are some of the limitations of the LLM, especially around context windows that um, 
that we need to be careful about? Yeah, ex excellent uh, question. So, you know, one thing you, you maybe do have to be careful about is while LLMs, so the context window is kind of a combination of like how many tokens can you put into the model and also how many tokens you need it to generate. And, you know, you can think of token roughly as the character count for English. It's, it's, it's equivalent to it. It's not exactly that. And it does vary for different languages, but, um, a lot of models now support these very long token counts. You can put in very long queries, you can add a lot of documents, but there's also been a lot of research that says the longer, especially for retrieval augmented generation, the longer these document sets get, the less good it is at using the information. So if you provide 20 documents, and there was a paper that actually studied this called uh, Lost in the Middle, which uh, you folks could look up. And they basically provided 20 documents to answer one question in the prompt and the correct answer was in like location six um, and then the accuracy of the model uh, of the answers dropped by like 30 40 percent versus if it was in like the first one two or three locations so there's a lot of need to not provide more information that's really necessary to solve the problem like you're going to get better results if you kind of really narrow it down to like, here's the the most relevant information. And I only need to give you a few examples to solve it. Okay. Very cool. We actually have a question. It's, um, it's regard from, um, uh, Shanti asking, uh, following up on the embeddings of books, why would vectors be focused on books by the same author? For example, can we search for a book that is about crime just in general? Like how, why are they, can you talk a little bit about the grouping and how those things actually occur? Yeah, I will admit that I think that example by authors is a little unusual. Like you can definitely do that. Um, but I think the graphic kind of shows how this works really nicely. And um, so we, we kind of reuse that one, but um, you are correct that usually you know in many use cases you would do it the way you're describing where like crime novels are in the same spot and comedies are in the same spot and, and sci-fi groups together um, because if you look at like the text content these things are kind of talking about the same concepts and ideas um, but the interesting thing is right if, if you need to do something by author and that's the way you want to group um, like you can do that right you could just build your text strings instead of embedding the whole documents you can embed like the titles and like the author's name as like the text string and then you would get an embedding space that's going to help you cluster by author name instead of by content of the book so you can always tweak these things based on what is the use case that that you want to solve cool all right um, and then here's a simple one, uh, you know, like structured data extraction. So if you think about the Instacart example, this is something they need to do, right? At the end, you've got a recipe and you say, build me a shopping cart. Well, they need to go back, analyze the recipe and get a list of ingredients. Um, there's not much you need to do here because LLMs are particularly good at this. I mean, this is, I, this is an example literally from just chat GPT where I, I wrote a little paragraph about George Banks and that he works in a bank in London and, you know, his age and then. I just asked it in the prompt, just to create me a JSON document that extracts name, age, profession, and location of the primary person discussed, gave them this text document, and it gives us this JSON. Um, there, I, you can't have more complex ish, um, data extraction issues where you might need to do some few shot learning. So you give it an input and you give it an output example. Here's a text, here's the information I want you to extract from it, give it three or four of those, and you can um, get some information out. But if it's a pretty simple structured data extraction, this will generally and this simple data extraction can be used to generate APIs to make calls to, let's say, uh, a checkout pipeline for actually doing these orderings, right? So, yeah, that's very, or that, that that's kind of, a, this is where the LLMs interact with the actual world, right? And LLMs are very good at producing JSON and also understanding and processing JSON, right? So they this is a good interaction, you know, interface between the rest of your application stack and the language model. Uh, we actually have a question from, um, uh, we have an extra question here and it's, and it's asking, can you define how the semantics, uh, similarity is defined? It's probably is asking, can you define how the various, uh, vectors are clustered together? It's like probably asking about embedding model techniques. Yeah. So there's, there's maybe two parts there. Um, as I was saying, you know, one is. Well, I guess there's there's three parts, I would say, right? One is structuring your initial data so that you'll get the right 
so so data will be nearby each other for the problem you want to solve. So we had the example earlier of if you want to uh, cluster books by author, you probably want to like have your text that you're embedding be the title of the book and the author's name. If you want to cluster books by genre, you can probably just you know, you would just process the actual text of the book itself and then rely on that for it to kind of group together kind of related types of books. Um, so that's kind of one. There's kind of embedding model choice. There's a lot of different embedding models out there. You know, there's vendor ones like OpenAI, there's open source ones. Um, they'll embed data in slightly different ways. So sometimes you might want to try different models to see if it does something better for your problem. And then the last piece is like, how do you tell that two vectors are similar? Right, which would be, um, there's various different similarity metrics that you use. Um, some of the most common ones would be like dot products or inner products, cosine similarity and Euclidean distance, right? So Euclidean distance you can think of as really just telling you how far apart are two vectors. Cosine similarity is more telling you what's the difference in the angle between two vectors. But under the hood, you use these, these uh, you know, math models to decide like how close together are two things and then you use that to decide which vector am i going to choose very cool all right and then just kind of really quickly like how would you put all of this together so this is just an example of kind of what does like the application stack look like when you build uh, an application that uses generative ai so you know, starting from the left you've got your application that you're building at your company right in the middle you're going to have the moving to the right you know, you're gonna have a service router come in, you'll have your, you know, eight, your APIs that kind of interface with this. And, you know, probably that goes down to some microservice architecture. This is all kind of just standard, really any application infrastructure at this point. But then from that point, you'll have agents. Agents are kind of the concept in generative AI world where the agent is kind of responsible for deciding what action should be taken. What external data do I need to fetch? Um, how am I going to combine this into generation steps to kind of solve my problem? That often relies on proprietary data that you have. So you need to kind of process that data. Um, you know, maybe it's batch data, maybe it's streaming data. Um, you generate embeddings like we talked about. So you have to have an embedding service. Uh, and again, there's vendor solutions for that and open source. And then you feed that data back into a vector store where you maintain it. And then you'll need some LLMs, um, which can be, again, from vendors or, or open source. All right. So I think what we want to, unless there's any other questions, I think maybe we want to jump into kind of seeing how we put all this together. So really quickly, we're going to show two examples. This first one is going to be a recipes example, but it uses the same patterns that booking.com and the shop app use, um, which is we need a set of embeddings. In this case, there'll be recipes. Um, we'll show how to do filtered vector search to kind of do a, not just search based on vectors, but put in some other criteria that we care about to make sure we're getting good results back. We'll look at re-ranking those results to get even better results from the vector search. And then for, there's a structured data extraction at the end, right, to kind of build the shopping cart. Um, and this is the kind of pattern that booking.com, shop app, and um, Instacart kind of all use. Um, this example will use open uh, some OpenAI stuff, some Lang stuff from Langchain, and for our vector store, we use uh, DataStax uh, AstroDB. And then, second example for kind of a Q&A chatbot. So we'll create embeddings of some PDF files and show how you use retrieval augmented generation and Flare, which is like a kind of fancier version of retrieval augmented generation. I'll talk about it in the demo. This one uses another library called Cassio that um, DataStax built that abstracts away the complexities of the database, just lets you kind of solve your LLM problem. Don't have to kind of worry about how the database works if you don't, if you aren't familiar with it. And then just really quickly, won't spend a lot of time with this, but, you know, why should you use AstroDB? Um, you know, people may not be familiar with Astra, but Astra is basically serverless version of Apache Cassandra, which I think a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, Cassandra scales very well. Um, on the serverless side, we're in all clouds. It's very cheap to run. Um, it's trusted by more than 90% of the Fortune 500. And more importantly, even though vector search is new for us, our indexing technology is, has been around for a long time. We've been working on it for 10 years. We have this nifty thing called storage attached indices. I won't get into that. 
but um, we, we use that same technology to do our vector search. So our vector search is not new. It leverages all this work that we've done to build kind of really effective search indexes. All right. Uh, you should be able to see, um, I know that the share screen, I think, shows up in a smaller box in, in the uh, webinar. There's a button to you know, make it bigger if you can't see it. Um, if you hover over it, you can full screen it or kind of make it larger. Also, um, there should be a, a button on the bottom for kind of documents that we've made available if it's not showing up. And if you click in that, there should be links to collab versions of these notebooks if you want to run through them on your own or have access to them afterwards. So actually, before you jump into there, do you mind going back to the to the diagram? There's actually a couple of questions here from the, the folks. Sure. So maybe the first question is, does the vector database, should you keep all your proprietary data in the vector database? Or is there some proprietary data that's not in the vector database versus others? Like what, where, what's appropriate? What proprietary data is appropriate in the vector database? So that's going to depend a little bit on the database you choose. Um, one of the advantages of Astra is we are not a purely vector database. Like we store all types of data. So you can put all of your application data to run your application in Astra. And the vectors are just another data type alongside a text and float and into the other type of data you'd want to store. So, you know, we would generally recommend kind of putting all of your data in there that you're going to need to run this application. So if there's other data that comes in, it's not part of the generative step, you can still build out those tables in Astra, and then you just have one database you're working with to kind of run your whole application. Okay. And uh, the other question is, um, you know, where, where do you quote unquote tools, I mean, the agent sense, what are tools fit into the diagram? How, 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 how do, uh, LLMs end up calling other APIs. Um, so maybe we'll hold on that one because I actually have an example of that in the notebook that we're going to run through. So I'll talk about it when we, we get to that as part of the recipe example. Okay. A few people are reporting that the Flare notebook uh, is not accessible, uh, that the link is broken. So we'll, we'll be fixing that uh, after this, or if Alejandro can do a quick uh, fix, that would also be, that would also work too. Wonder if we just somehow have the wrong link because uh, the the viewing permissions are correct. We'll we'll double check and send it out afterwards. All right. So um, to run this recipes workbook, um, you would need an open a a a AI API key, and then you need some con connection. Um, credentials for Astro DB. You can get these on our website at astro.datastacks.com. Um, and you know, here's the the module we're using. You'll see I'm not running this in Colab. Um, I uh, this one happens to be a local copy, but um, that's fine. This is just some text cleaning. Pro tip: good thing for generative models because they tend to run out of space when you you know runs off the edge of the screen when you generate the text. This just fixes that. Um, I won't talk too much about how I process the data set. You guys are welcome to look at the notebook, but. This data set is basically a, a food.com set of recipes as well as user interactions and reviews that's available on Kaggle. Um, this kind of predates the popularity of LLMs. So the data is actually very structured. They already kind of pulled it all apart um, in a way that you wouldn't really do with LLMs anymore. You would just kind of process the raw text. So a lot of the data prep is actually reassembling the original recipe. Um, so, you know, you load and prep that data basically all this is doing is giving us a full text document of the recipe with all the ingredients, the steps, the instructions, the title, and adding in the average review score um, for each recipe, which we'll use later on. Um, the next part's just connecting to Astra. You need kind of two pieces for this. There's a secure connect bundle you download from our website, as well as a token you generate and download. Um, there's a quick connect button on a database that will just generate all these files for you, and you can just upload them and then you connect to the, to the data set. Um, in this case, as I mentioned, we've got a library called CASIO that kind of abstracts a lot of the underlying database stuff, but I just kind of wanted to show how it works in this example. So it's pretty straightforward. You know, We've got a table, it's got a recipe ID, it's got the text of the embedding, it's got the full text of the recipe because we might need that. So like the recipe is broken up into different chunks, but you know, at some point you might want to return the full recipe so we keep the full text, we keep the title, 
the rating, and then you can see we've got like a float vector that's got 768 dimensions, which is the size from our embedding model. And then, you know, you create an index to search this. We use cosine similarity, and then I also create an index so I can search on the ratings as well. Um, the next step is you've got to um, generate and load data to Astra, uh, create the embeddings. You can do this with OpenAI. Um, this data set has about 200,000 recipes, so I didn't really want to do this on OpenAI because I regenerated a lot of times and I didn't want to pay the money for that. So um, I ran an open source model called the Instructor Embeddings. They're linked here, and there's actually a repo that has the embedding service that um, is just a RESTful API service that wraps that and generates the embeddings. Um, it uses a sentence chunker instead of just a even text splitter, so it preserves sentence boundaries. And then uh, if you want to run all of this yourself, this particular embedding service runs pretty well on M1 and M2 Max on Apple Silicon on CPU. If you're not on a CPU, it's a little bit slow, takes a few seconds. Um, so I'd recommend like a GPU with CUDA if you're running on um, like a Linux image or an Intel system. Okay. Yeah, related to that, like I, we actually have a question and it's like, the question specifically said, like, how do you name the number types residing in the vector database in Astra? And I think what uh, is being really asked, like, how do you differentiate between like unstructured data versus kind of structured data, and how do you query the two, and maybe marry them up together? Yeah, so we'll see a little bit of that as we kind of go through this. But you can see, like, we've got kind of text types, so for the different text fields we've got. We've got a float type here because the rating is you know, between zero and five and has decimals. And then um, the vector type, and you can have as many of these types, you know, you can keep creating more columns on this. Like we support you know, very wide um, columns. So you can kind of just keep adding the data that you need to kind of make this work. Um, and I'll show how you actually filter on this uh, a little further down. Cool. Uh, so quickly to generate the data, you just do, uh, I kept two prepare statements here. Let's just remove one. Okay, just a simple insert statement to put the data in. I call I call the API service with the text. You get back multiple embeddings, so you loop over them and you just do an insert, right? And then we've got text. Um, so now let's look at how the chatbot itself works. And so for this part, I did use Langchain. This is using GPT 3.5 Turbo from OpenAI, uh, and I'm going to ask it, "Hi, uh, recipe bot. You know, I want to." eat some Mexican food tonight, right? Um, and then let's let's look at the prompt. So there was this question about how do you call the external tools? Um, and this kind of shows how to do this. So we use a pattern, there's a, there's a paper called Tool Former, it's from Meta AI Research. And you basically tell it, you know, this is an example of an external API call, okay? So you tell it, hey, when you wanna recommend a recipe, use an API to get the recipes. And you can see up here, I tell it, do not create your own recipes, right? Use an API. You can call the API by writing recipes description, where description describes what recipe you're searching for. Only make one API call each time, because otherwise it'll make like three or four, which we don't want. And um, if no food or recipe was mentioned, don't make an API call, right? Because we don't want to do that. And then you, then you do some few shot learning. So you give it an example. I would like to eat Italian food tonight. Say, great, here are some recipes for Italian food call the API with Italian food. Same thing for like, I would like to cook some spicy Indian chicken. I insert spicy Indian chicken. So let's see. So down here, so I, I, I ran that and you can see, you know, here's the result. So the model says, sure, Mexican cuisine is always a great choice. Here are some recipes for Mexican food, you know, and it puts in this API call. Yeah. There's a second step here. So this is a chained model. So I actually made two calls. The second one is basically telling the model to ask follow-up questions, right? So if you say, I want Mexican food, that's pretty generic. You know, maybe you want them to get more specific. So ask them to ask some clarifying questions. And again, with few shot learning, you show them how to do this, right? Oh, if you would like to eat Italian food, what are you looking for? Maybe you want seafood, meat, or pasta, right? Or what kind, if you ask, I want to cook pork today, what kind of pork would you like? You know, there's sweet recipes, savory recipes, different, different ethnic styles. Um, okay, so we do two generations, and then the last step is a prompt that just says, hey, combine these two things. And then it's important when you combine them and tell it, hey, preserve this recipe's API call, because that's not a standard thing in the language model, right? So if you look at this, what do we get? On the first pass, we already showed this example from the vector search, where it gives us you know, a search thing for Mexican food. On the second pass, it says, 
hey, there's a lot of different kinds of variety of foods in Mexican food. Are you in the mood for something more specific like tacos, enchiladas, or a hearty soup? And so then if you ask them to combine the two, right, you get a combined thing where it will say Mexican food is a great choice. It's going to show you some Mexican recipes and it's going to ask you if you want to do something fancier, um, cook something more specific, right? So then how do you execute the API call? Um, in this case, right, you just, you just need to kind of grep out the... Um, the, the, the API call itself, right? So you just write, you can write like a regex that just looks for API calls. And then you have a lookup table that says, oh, if it's recipes, I'm gonna do this particular recipes function call. If it's do something else, right, I can, I can make other function calls. They can be external APIs, they can be internal APIs to my application. And so here you see the search recipes function, right? So what do I have to do? I take the query, Mexican food, I embed it, I get back the vector, and then here's how I search the database, right? So I say, hey, return me the title, rating, and full text from my recipes data. Limit it to ratings that are greater than 3.0. I don't want low scoring ones. So this does a filtering step before it does the vector search. Gets rid of bad recipes right off of the bat. Okay, And then look at my vectors and give me the ones closest to Mexican food. Limit it to the top you know, three um, items. I don't want like 100. So. Looks like if I do that, you can see I get back some yaki soft tacos. I get back a peanut butter raspberry pita, which is not exactly a taco, but it's kind of like a taco. And I get vegetarian bean and lentil tacos. Um, quickly, the next thing I said I would show, right, is, well, let's do that search re-ranking, right? So instead of taking the top three, let's take the top 100. And then let's re-rank based on rating, right? Show me the top rated ones and then just return the top three like before. So now I get a different set of recipes, right? I get this um, Oaxaca beef taco. I get, um, interesting, it got a pot roast. So, you know, that, that was not great. And then it got um, uh, a, a Blanco white cheese dip. Um, so you probably need to adjust the temperature a little bit. On different runs, it's been, it's been better with this. And then the last step that we talked about was you need to extract the ingredient list. Right, again, very simple prompt. Create a JSON that contains a list of ingredients needed to cook the recipe below. It gives you an ingredient list as a JSON that's a, a list data structure. So I have a couple of questions here. If you go back up to the, go back up to the part where you're doing the query, like, like what, what, why would you want to use filtered vector search? Like, is there some advantages of that? Yeah, so, so there's, there, there are definitely a few advantages. First one, let's just think from like a perspective of our product, right, that we're building here, which is like recommending recipes and getting people to add things to their shopping cart. Um, you know, in this particular data set, there are a lot of recipes that have like a 0 0.5 score, a one out of five stars. Um, you probably don't want to put those in front of people because you're not going to get a click, right? When they see, if you, because you probably render this in a nice card and have the title, have a picture and it would have the star rating, right? So if you show one star, no one's going to click on that recipe and say, hey, make me a shopping list out of it. So, you know, that's kind of improving the results of your product. Um, from a technical standpoint, this is also important because, you know, the recipes data set is quite, is pretty large in this case. Um, there's about 200,000 recipes, which results in 500,000 embeddings or something like that. It's not gigantic, but it's decent size. Um, when you do this filtered search first, it just removes a lot of data from the data set. Um, so that makes the, the ANN um, query work better. It's, it, it, it's more accurate because, and we didn't touch on this too much, but an ANN is approximate nearest neighbor. It's not true nearest neighbor, right? So as your data sets get bigger, when you do an approximate nearest neighbor search, you have more inaccuracies and did you truly find the nearest neighbor to your particular query vector? So this technique will improve that. I also want to comment that uh, beside ANN, just doing the K nearest neighbor, what happens is that the accuracy of K nearest neighbor, unfortunately, is very, very sensitive to the outliers, uh, the, the total number of outliers that are that is being searched over. And you know, outliers and data is inevitable. Um, so by nature of having a smaller data set, you're reducing your outliers so that the KNN algorithm works better as well. So speed, performance, uh, sorry, uh, speed, improvement of relevance. I think these are all important factors for, you know, trying to constrain your search space for ANN 
uh, as quickly as possible prior to doing your approximate nearest neighbor search. Cool. Um, a couple other questions I saw kind of flow through. One question was like, why are there 500,000 vectors if there's only 200,000 recipes? Um, that's due to the chunking step at the beginning. So the recipe text is too long for the particular embedding models that we use. They're limited to about 512 characters, which is about two to three sentences of text in English. Um, so you have to chunk up the recipe into kind of different parts um, and then feed the, put that into the vector database and then search over it. Um, if you think about longer examples, let's say we're doing Q&A on like a PDF file, you wouldn't be able to put the whole PDF as a single embedding. You would probably chunk it by paragraph or also by a few sentences. Uh, sorry, just scanning if there's any other questions. Um, there was a question about um, kind of uh, indexing in Astra and Elasticsearch or some of these other methods. Um, but a nifty thing about the way that Astra indexing works is it's a uh, the index is built in a way where you can query it immediately. So a lot of other databases that provide vector search, you have to wait for the index to first build before you can search. And how long that takes kind of depends on how much data you loaded, how fast you loaded it, and and their their particular implementation. So, you know, in some cases maybe you only have to wait a couple minutes, but like there are cases where you might have to wait 10 or 20 minutes before the index is available for searching. So that's kind of one um, spot where our technology works a bit different than some others out there. Yeah, I would say also too, so for example, if you're interacting with the chat bot and the chat bot is asking, oh, what are your kind of pref what kind of products do you like? And they use that information to, uh, to uh, recommend you items. So you might type something in natural language like, oh, I like, I like red shirts, I like et cetera, et cetera. That needs to be turned into a vector immediately. Uh, otherwise it can't be used in the subsequent uh, calls by the chat bot. So that, that becomes uh, really important too in order to have like kind of an interactive experience with the, uh, with the chat bot. All right, I know we're coming up on the top of the hour and I think also we were supposed to only be 45 minutes. So I'll, I'll show this last one um, quickly. Um, so we talked about the other use case being this kind of you know question answering over document sets. And so one way to do this is with, uh, so one, this always works off of some flavor of retrieval augmented generation. Flare is a improvement on that called forward looking active retrieval augmented generation. And um, how that works is basically as the LLM is generating a response, when it, when it sees that it's going to create a new token in the response and it's not very confident about that particular token, it's going to execute additional vector searches to pull in more data to help it answer the question. So in this example, the task that was assigned to the LLM was write a summary about Joe Biden. So it writes, Joe Biden attended, and then when it tries to plug in the next token of where he attended, it realizes, I don't really know the answer to that question. So it does another search for Joe Biden, you know, school, Joe Biden University, pulls back a document that tells it, oh, hey, he attended the University of Pennsylvania, and then says, okay, great, where he earned, and then it realizes, I don't know what degree he got. So it does another search for his, you know, degree that he holds. So this process is able to basically on the fly generate additional questions, run additional uh, database queries, and return more data to try to get a better answer to the question. Um, similar setup to the last notebook, so I won't kind of go through that. Um, by the way, once once you're able to access this notebook, it's set up where you can bring your own data. Like if you create a folder in Google Drive, you can upload any PDFs you want to it, and then you can kind of set that PDF location here, and you can just run it on your own data. In this case, I queued up a bunch of papers about LLM research, so they kind of cover prompting techniques. So it covers chain of thought, um, self-consistency, LLMs can self-debug, um, how LLMs can be used to generate um, SQL code. So uh, about eight papers in this example. Um, this example uses our library CASIO. So you'll see you don't have to define any um, Cassandra tables. You don't have to do any Cassandra data modeling. Um, 
CASIO is an integrated upstream into many popular uh, frameworks for working with LLMs. So it's integrated with Langchain and it's integrated with Llama Index. And so you can kind of see really all you have to do here is import the Cassandra vector store from Langchain to then kind of build this example. And that's really kind of all it takes. So um, we download the PDFs from Google Drive. We create our Cassandra vector store. The, only thing you really have to do is tell it what embedding model you're using. You have to have initialized uh, a connection to the database, and then you need to tell it what's the name of the table I want to use. And it will just create the table and create all the structure you need. CASIO does support creating, adding metadata and doing metadata filtering as well. So you can do all of that through this interface without kind of going through the you know manual kind of data modeling I did in the last example. Uh, here we do a text splitter that just evenly breaks up all the characters in the document to evenly sized um, chunks of 500 characters and with an overlap of 80 uh, characters. So you kind of want to have an overlap in case you've broken the document at a bad spot and you've kind of lost the context. Like if you broke it mid-sentence or mid-paragraph, you might not get a good result. So you want to do some overlap so you kind of carry the information con context over better. So, you know, you load the PDFs, you do the splitting, and then you basically just tell it to add to the vector store these text documents. And then it does the embeddings and it, it stores it. And that's really kind of all you need to do. Um, this shows you can do like a count on the table to see how many embeddings you generated. And we have about 3,000. So um, now let's go to the generation step of this. Uh, here's a few queries that I'm going to run. So the first one is uh, my chatbot is giving incorrect instructions on how to perform tasks in the UI. How can I fix this? Um, we set up the vector store as a retriever for the retrieval augmented generation. That's again, one call in Langchain. Um, and this, you know, the vector store was already created with Cassandra in the prior cell. And then I'm gonna initially initialize just chat GPT here. And then I'm gonna initialize Flare that uses Cassandra for the retrieval. And then I just run that question and I run it in the LLM and I run it in Flare. Uh, just a just quick, comment here is a question. Uh, so Flare is a general architectural pattern. There's papers published on it. But the nice thing about Langchain is they have an OBOX implementation for this pattern. It's also in other frameworks such as Llama Index, et cetera. So let's look at this LLM result first. You see it's very general. And this is what you'll see, right? Because it doesn't know how to solve this particular problem. So look at your training data collect user feedback, debug logic in your code, right? General steps of how I do this, but no like specific information. Um, Flare is gonna say, well, let's see, you know, answer is a little different each time, but um, it says you need to debug, which it also says, it says you need to look at the prompt instructions and you need, you need to use code. And if you need more help, it's gonna it's telling you to specifically look at a specific paper, all right? So it's recommending a specific paper here. Let's run this one more time. And this time I'm gonna turn on some debugging. So you can turn on this debugging flag or this verbosity flag in, Lang, uh, in uh, Langchain to kind of get more information on what happened. This dumps a lot of information, but I'm really just looking for one part, which should be in yellow. Okay, here we go. So this was that part about Flare generates additional questions as it runs. So these are new, new questions that it made, right? So we asked this question about there was a problem in my UI and it didn't help me answer it. So I asked, what is one possible solution to fix your chatbot's incorrect instructions? What should you check to ensure your instructions are correct? Um, this one is, what might you need to do if checking the settings doesn't fix the issue with your chatbot's instructions and what might you need to do to reprogram in order to improve its instruction set, right? So we've basically run these uh, four or five questions now, gotten a lot of different results and then used them to kind of combine to get the final answer. All right, and we're at the, we're at the top of the hour. So um, kind of stop there see if there's any kind of final questions. And so maybe a final question that was asked uh, that would be good to wrap up. But the question was like, hey, if I'm a small development shop, uh, do I need special skill? Does it make sense to hire developers with some minimal knowledge of stats or linear algebra? Or do I need to go up to like hire very, very high end uh, data scientists? So, you know, this is the kind of one of the game changing things about generative AI and LLMs is you don't 
necessary. You don't need a data scientist to kind of solve these problems anymore. In fact, you know, I've worked with people that had no data background, no statistics background, front end developers, full stack developers who have been able to build very successful um, generative AI applications that were deployed into production at companies that I worked at. Um, if you can kind of think logically and understand how to use these prompt techniques that are really uh, common, that's kind of all you need, need to know to do. So the programming language for these things is English, right? That's what uh, what's the Andre Kaparthi from Tesla and OpenAI um, has said, right? So you you write out, so what you need to study is how does prompt engineering works, right? It's, it's, it's a new field accessible to any developer to kind of build these things and kind of do them on their own. And you don't even necessarily need a back end for some of this stuff. If you're a front end developer, and you're just going to use like open AI, you can actually put your logic into the, your front end code if you wanted and just call these services to kind of do a lot of the work for you. Um, so a, a lot of new possibilities that maybe were not so easy to do before. Okay, uh, one last question. Uh, do you use external libs like Facebook face to handle numeric types in the vector database? No. Uh, so. Facebook face is like another way to do kind of what we showed, right? So they're kind of a pure software module that runs in memory that builds a vector index and lets you search it. Um, you can do that same thing in Astra. Um, you know, the faces is uh, the face library is not a bad way to get started with things, but um, you know, I, I think a lot of people are reluctant to take that into production because you don't get a lot of the guarantees that you get with a database, right? You don't have data replication. You don't have the ability to kind of scale up with that type of library. Um, but under the hood, you're kind of doing the same thing, which is providing a way to do like vector search. The other thing with the face library is you have to build the whole index before you can use it. It doesn't have a capability like you've got in Astra to be using the database while it's being built, while the index is being built. All right, so I think that's all the questions. So thank you everyone for attending. Um, if you wanna build an app, go sign up on Astra and we're looking forward to what everyone's gonna be building. Thank you.